Welcome back to Sunday Vibes, one and all. As you can see, sadly, we're not in the pub this week. Christopher Hamill is on holiday. Patrick Van Straten is on holiday. And we didn't really have the resource with the bank holiday to get down the old boozer. We got too much on, but I am glad to say I'm joined by Zach Jalab and Doogie Critchley. Doogster, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm in jubilant mood. It was a hell of a transfer window, yes. wasn't it? I mean, every pretty much every world-class player in world football linked with a move away at various stages Messi and Ronaldo moving Haaland and Mbappe staying there's a lot to digest in this episode I'm buzzing for it yeah absolutely buzzing Zachary all good all good my friend all good all right let's crack on with the show then the main question that was sent in this week was sent in by Max the Andrel don't know what on earth that is what's an Andrel <laughs> um, and he says who won the transfer window so who did win it do we want to take a team each? Do you want to just pitch in? Zach, let's come to you first. Who are you give, giving the Ooh. biggest winners award to? Um, I think it's... I'm kind of split down the middle between Manchester United and uh, Chelsea. Mm. I think both kind of had a, a, a lot of positives um, and less and, and not so many negatives. Premier League um, only, I, isn't it? Premier League only. Yeah, indeed. PSG indeed, would yeah. Have, obviously it would have slapped it up uh, easily. Um, the only reason I probably maybe slightly lean towards Chelsea more so, not because I'm biased, but because <laughs> I think they filled more positions that were, were needed. United have done brilliantly with their transfers. Obviously, bringing in Cristiano Ronaldo is fantastic, and I'm sure we'll talk plenty about him. They also, you know, got the right wing spot done by bringing in uh, James Sancho, and obviously getting rid of Daniel James as well. That seemed like both both parties were pretty happy to split up there, um, and getting Rafael Varane, and not just getting him in, but getting him in on a fantastic deal as well. Um, the only issue where I would say that they maybe then put some down slightly for me, uh, and it, out of five, I'd put them at like a 4.5, literally basically a five, um, is that that DM slot. Um, yeah. Not being able to get someone in for that. Obviously, we saw Camavinga go as well to Real Madrid when, when they were interested, and Chelsea bringing in Saul Niguez um, for a loan of €4 million. Euros. I would have thought I'd like to have seen maybe Manchester United try to, to battle more for that. I know they don't have a lot of money, mm. but... 4 million euros for a one year loan with an option to buy, not even an obligation, an option to buy for 40 mil. Um, feels like something that they could have been a part of mm. as well. And, and and not to say that Chelsea don't need him, because Chelsea definitely do, especially after N'Golo Kante picked up a little knock against Liverpool. We're not too sure how he'll be this season with his injury record. Um, and letting Billy Gilmore go on loan for the season. It means Chelsea going to the season with with three players for two for those two positions. Um, and that's obviously Mason Mount can maybe drop into there. Ruben Loftus cheek could also play there. But but realistically, the three players of Kovacic, Jorginho, and Kante are, are, are there. So getting in Saul Niguez for them was fantastic. But he's not going to be playing anywhere near as much as he would have if maybe he was playing in the Manchester United squad. And we know how kind of recently a lot of people have been um, criticising Fred, and rightly so. Um, and that position for me could have been um, much, much more improved. But still, it's like a fantastic window for both clubs, full stop. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the one upside as well that Chelsea have over United is they did much better outgoing business, in my mm. opinion. The outgoings okay, yeah. at Chelsea... Uh, they've really found the fantastic formula of getting backup players and young players out of the club for good fees or at least uh, with the option to bring them back. Like to get rid of Tammy, Kurt Zuma and Fikeo Tomori for a combined, what was it, 85, 90 million pounds is just absolutely outrageous business, man. There's no other club in the Premier League other than maybe Liverpool that have done as good at outgoing business as that with backup players over the last couple of years. Um, even to get fees for, you know, Victor Moses, Zappa Costa, to get some or good T loan deals. Tino Andrew has just gone as well to Russia. He's not even played a minute, and I think they bought him for like 15 million. Yeah, 17 it's, million it's, as well. it's really smart business. And also, a lot of these players, I believe you've got sort of buyback or at least first refusal yeah. options in their contracts, especially we know that is the case with uh, Tammy Abraham at Roma at about 80 million euros. I think that becomes active from 2023, doesn't it? You have mm. lost a, a fair few top academy talent i.e. Livermento. I'm not sure what the options are with buybacks and sell-ons with a player like him, but from what I've seen at the start of the season, he looks an exceptional talent. So um, I think Chelsea have definitely done better outgoings. As for incomings, I still think Manchester United's summer has been better than Chelsea in terms of incomings. I don't know what you think, Duke. You're coming from the neutral standpoint. Give us your opinion. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, every everyone knows the glaring, obvious, you know, lack of that central midfielder in, in that United squad, and it has really been glaringly obvious at the start of this season as well. Less so in the Leeds game, but particularly against Southampton mm. and Wolves. I don't think Pogba suits that double pivot at all. He looked like one of the best players again in the Premier League, playing on that left wing or with that sort of free role he had before. Not sure why Oli's reverted to putting him back into central midfield alongside Fred, who has started the season pretty disastrously I'd have to oh, say. Oh, McTominay's injured. I think that's probably why, mate. He's had to have surgery. Fair. Okay, well, hopefully McTominay can come back in and shore yeah. things up because Fred just doesn't suit that role <laughs> at all. That sitting role is just not Fred's game. Um, but in terms of United's incomings, you, you know, you can't really fault them too much. In terms of, you know, take away wages for a second, Rafa Varane for £36 million or £34 million, whatever it was, it doesn't really get any better than that in terms of a centre-back mm -hmm. like available. Like He's won a World Cup, won yeah. four Champions Leagues, 360 appearances for Real Madrid, rarely injured. I think prior to last year where he missed eight games, four of which were with Covid, he'd never missed more than four, five games in a single season in the previous four years. And started really well against Wolves, I thought, in a pretty shambolic midfield and attacking performance. I thought he was pretty good, to be honest, uh, alongside Maguire, and I think he'll make a massive, massive difference. Then you're adding one of the best wingers available for that price in world football, probably one of the best young players in the world in Jadon Sancho, who, you know, hasn't been given a lot of minutes by Oli so far. I think he's still being eased back in after that break following the Euros, but he's been phenomenal for a number of years. Yes, last year was a slight dip until about November time, but he still ended up with eight goals and 11 assists. 17 goals and 16 assists the year before that in the Bundesliga. Like, they've got a massive re uh, reduction on the fee that Dortmund quoted the year before. And then you're adding Cristiano Ronaldo into that front line. Like, it probably wasn't the signing that they planned to make. It probably wasn't the signing they needed most. But when Man City were so close to signing him, and don't you forget those Man United fans that were sort of, you know, saying Messi's the best player ever, all this sort of stuff pre-U-turn. Never him. Joe, to be fair. Never Joe, to be fair. Or McCubbin. Um, but yeah, there were some United fans losing it on Twitter. But yeah, they've signed Cristiano Ronaldo, who pretty much guarantees goals. Like, the issue with it at Juventus was, does his sort of aura does his playing style make the team a less cohesive attacking unit but you can't fault his output it's still 101 goals in 134 games he takes over five shots per 90 his expected goals last year was 0.96 that's nearly 0.3 more than the best in the premier league last year harry kane like his output is still exceptional and i back him to score close to 25 league goals probably maybe 30 in all comps i, I don't know wow. he's missed a few games to start with but Jesus. he's he's going to be right up there so for United, I think now, I don't really want to see any any excuses for, you know, not either having a better title challenge or a massive improvement in points because this window couldn't really have gone any better for you. And yes, you'll point out the lack of defensive midfielder, but you could do that pretty much with every squad bar Chelsea in the, in the top four. I think Man City obviously have a bit of a deficiency at left back. Some of their depth in striking areas isn't very good. Chelsea probably have the most complete squad, but other than that, you could probably pick holes in most squads in that top four race. So I think United, yeah, this this window, very, very impressive. And I think it ramps up the pressure for sure. Just as a leaf sweeper comes in behind me. I'm sorry if you guys can hear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's absolutely no excuses for Oli now. Um, I know that people will point to that defensive midfield position and it obviously is a problem for Manchester United. And I do think it is... Having a problem in centre mid is slightly worse than having a problem at full back or having a problem on the wing. True. I think that central midfield area is so key in the Premier League now, especially when you're trying to break teams down and you're trying to transition quickly. If you don't have the players in there to do that, it's not ideal. But there is really no excuses for Oli at this stage. He's he's had plenty of windows, he's spent plenty of money, he now has to put in a concerted title challenge to be within sort of three or four points of the title in my opinion he has to win a trophy this season and I think with players like Ronaldo he will I think Ronaldo could be a huge difference maker in some of the trophies that Oli has stumbled with so far in semi-finals and finals Let's not forget that man, people will point to the fact that Manchester United have an abundance of attacking talent. And it's really true. Probably one or two too many players in that forward area. You think of maybe Jesse Lingard. Feels like a little bit of a bit part mm. role for him now. Anti Martial, not entirely sure where he fits in. But equally, you can caveat that with no Manchester United player has scored 20 league goals in a single season since Robin Van Persie. And that was in 2012. So we're nearly mm. a decade on since the player last scored 20 or more Premier League goals. 
Um, United have last season seen Bruno Fernandes far and away their most prolific goal scorer. I think he was 18 in the Premier League. Then we're sort of down to, what was it 11 from Edinson Cavani maybe? Then maybe not nine from Mason Greenwood, something like that. Those numbers are not good enough to win you a Premier League title. You have to have someone, or at least... In Man City's case, you, you just spread it amongst 35 players. But the majority of teams have to have someone through the middle that is going to score them close or if not more than 20 goals in order to win that top title. Um, and fingers crossed, Ronaldo is going to do that. It wasn't the most necessary move. It was a luxury signing. It was a romantic signing. We probably only made the move because Manchester City were kind of sniffing around and had reportedly agreed deals. But that's not to say it's a bad one. It's not to mm. say it's a bad one. And Manchester United can absorb, are one of the few clubs that are lucky enough that they can absorb that sort of wage without having too much issue. It's also only a two-year deal, isn't it? So it's not like an Alexi Sanchez four or five-year contract that could go completely tits up and we're uh, playing him in the reserves. I just don't see that happening with Cristiano Ronaldo, to be honest with you. Um, so I think United had the best summer of any incomings. And I think Chelsea had probably the most well-rounded summer because they already had a better squad than United to add Lukaku in there, to add Sal Niguez, and then to clear out a lot of the players they did for 120 odd million pounds is pretty exceptional. But I think we should drop down the table a little bit. And I want to talk next about Crystal Palace. I did a we I did a we need to talk midweek about Patrick Vieira's side saying that I actually think they've had one of the best windows of any side. Their recruitment business sack has just been unbelievable. It's next level compared to what they've done over the last <laughs> few years. I mean, yeah, 100%. Compared to the team as well that they had last season um, and have lost about half of them, whether that is due to, to age and not wanting to give them a new contract or, or the players that they did offer a new contract, like Gary Cahill just not accepting them. Um, they've done very, very well to, to replace them. I'm counting uh, Townsend, Van Aanholt, um, Saka, Hennessy, Cahill, Dan, McCarthy, Wickham. Now, these are all players who mm. were, were fine, um, but you, you weren't necessarily excited personally to, to see them on the team sheet. Um, I mean, I think Townsend, Townsend's moved to, to Everton and, and not, not the worst still, um, to be quite honest. But the guys they've replaced them with, if I'm a Crystal Palace fan, I'm so excited. Yeah. Because not only are they... Um, because not only are they these, these people that have a, a huge future, but they're so young. So that even if they do become really do become really good in the Premier League, they can sell them on for for much more than they bought them for. Mark Gehi they brought in for twenty one million pounds. Anderson, who was amazing at Fulham last year, um, they got for fifteen million pounds. Odson Edward, who Hamill has has um, spoken <laughs> lots about and who and who believes he can be a very good Premier League player, they've just brought in for fourteen million pounds. Olayse eight million pounds. Will Hughes six million pounds. Uh, Conor Gallagher, who's, who started really well, um, he is on loan. But who knows? Maybe if you know we get to the summer uh, he's still not got a place in that Chelsea side they could then try and bring him in permanently as well um, these are fantastic signings who are going to be at Palace for for a while if they want them to maybe they, uh, another club comes in for a lot more money but um, it's, it is really really good again the only issue we've always kind of mentioned is Patrick Vieira we don't know um, what's going to happen with him. Maybe he is a, a coach that is going to surprise us and, and does well. And, and with the players at his disposal, he has every chance of doing so. I mean, we've yet to even mention that they've already got um, Wilfred Zaha. They've got Eze, who, who is injured at the moment, will be coming back. And um, I think, who's the who's the fullback at, uh, at left-back? Uh, Mitchell. Mitchell. Mitchell as well. Another 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 young young guy. I mean, Crystal Palace have gone from having one of the older squads in the Premier League to to not, you know, to one of the youngest, I think. Uh, I don't know that factually, but it feels like it. Um, I think they've dropped to like 28 been, average age. So sort of middle of the back. The, Okay, but, but compared to what they had last year, and they brought in so many Definitely. younger guys to kind of bring in that youth, um, it's it's fantastic business. Um, I think a lot of Palace fans probably wouldn't have thought it had gone as well as it has done um, when they were speaking about all the contracts that they need to give out and all the players that only have a couple of months left on their deals uh, last season. So I think compared to how bad it could have been, and we have seen it gone bad before for for Palace and for other teams alike, um, they've done they've done pretty well. Uh, with, with their business, and they've not necessarily spent a lot of money. The fact that their biggest their biggest signings, Mark Gehi, 
um, who, who hadn't even played a Premier League game before uh, playing for Palace, I think speaks wonders. Yeah, I, I totally agree with the age profile comments you just made there. I think that's been crucial for Crystal Palace to bring that age profile of that squad down over the last few years as these old players have run down their contract and they couldn't, in my head, I'm not sure they could have targeted many better options than these guys. We kind of, at Football Daily, people hit us with this stick of saying, oh, you just think that everybody under 24 is a good player, blah, blah, blah. But I think, you know, Mark Guehi coming out of the championship with Swansea last year was arguably the best centre-back in the entire league. Um, so even if he was 26, you'd be saying that's a very good option. We saw what Wacky Manderson is capable of with that Fulham side. Even though they went down, I think anybody who saw Fulham last year was able to see that Wacky Manderson was far too good for that side. Odson Edwards' record up in Scotland, admittedly it is only Scotland, I think is like 120 goals involvements in like 180 odd games, which is again, very, very impressive. Just ask Chris Hamill what he thinks he can bring to the Premier League. I think um, Hamill talks about him in absolutely glowing terms. Michael Olise, again, one of the best players in the championship and we're seeing continued impact now of championship players in the Premier League and at the Premier League's level. Look at what Eze was able to do for Crystal Palace before he sadly picked up that injury. So these aren't just young players that could be hits, could be misses. They have proved themselves to be able to play at pretty elite levels, in my opinion. And I think Crystal Palace, for what they could have done, have done the best possible outcome, Dukes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it just it just requires a bit of time, really, with Patrick Vieira, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. they haven't got off to the best of starts, necessarily. That draw against Brentford at home, where they were... Pretty unfortunate. Rea made some phenomenal saves and then, you know, came back from 2-0 down at the weekend with two great goals from, from Conor Gallagher. But their defence was ripped apart by uh, Mikel Antonio for that goal in, the, I think it was their second goal. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. I mean, if, if you can just see that if, if it doesn't really go well the first three months, Vieira might be under serious pressure. The name Frank mm. de Boer starts getting banded around. But I think... <laughs> With this, with this squad and the players they brought in, like on paper, there should be three worse teams than them. So they've got to keep faith with Vieira and give him a proper shot at this. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think they'll axe him straight away, but he must be sort of one of the contenders for the throne of like first to go, just mm. because of Crystal Palace's history of, of getting rid of that De Boer sort of uh, manager who just didn't work out immediately but even if he was to like the squad is in a really good position for whoever Absolutely, else comes yeah. in I do still think though that, that he'll he'll do a fine job there Patrick Vieira uh, another size then anybody else got any other suggestions they want to talk about well I think uh, so, sorry. sorry I think just after you know a lot of their fans complaining throughout the window I think West Ham actually finished exceptionally yes. strongly um, Kurt Azuma coming in I think that's a massively like a fantastic signing particularly how David Moyes likes the centre-backs to play. He's really, really solid in the air. He adds goal threat at the other end as well. I think Craig Dawson and Og Bonner have been really pretty good for them since that partnership was created in, was it January that Craig Dawson arrived at the club? Um, but yeah, Kurt Zuma's, I think, a step up on either one of them. Um, I'd probably expect him to play alongside Og Bonner maybe, but we'll see what happens there. Maybe Moyes will shift to a three at the back as well and then have Soufal and, and Cresswell as his wing-backs, which is pretty exciting there as well. Vlasic obviously arrived for big, big money um, on, on deadline day mm. from CSK Moscow when they couldn't get in Lingard. They brought in Kral as well from Spartak Moscow. He's a defensive midfielder, used to play for Slavia Prague, where Moyes loves to do his shopping these days. And then they got Ariola in on loan as well, who will sort of up the game of Fabianski, who had his odd shaky moment last year as well. But hopefully Ariola keeps him on his toes and you know, Fabianski gets injured at any point, which it looked like his body is starting to, you know, get and you know more frequently injured over the last couple of years. Then Ariola will be a really effective option to come in. But Vlasic is an interesting one because you know he was obviously had that spell at Everton under Sam Allardyce, didn't go so well from there. Then they sold him to CSK in Moscow, and obviously I don't watch a lot of Russian Premier League games, but I did occasionally catch him in Europe, and he looks like a really useful contributor at that level. Like he was playing well in the Europa League, he was playing well in the Champions League. Probably feels like this deal, which apparently can rise to as much as £38 million, is a bit of a risk. Um, but he does have a very good record in Russia. He sounded like he was clearly too good for that league by the end of it. He's only 23 as well. 12 goals and 5 assists in 2019-20. 11 goals and 5 assists last year as well. Takes over four shots a game. Nearly three key passes as well. I've instantly tried to waver him in our uh, draft <laughs> fantasy and uh, for the, the Football Daily draft as well. And... I think with Fournals and Ben Rama starting to hit their straps, 
at West Ham. I think Vlasic is a great another option to have in there. I watched a YouTube compilation of him yesterday, which is probably not the best research, to be honest, but you know, it makes every player look fantastic. But he looked like he was physically ready for the league. He takes shots from good areas. He's got an excellent, like powerful right boot on him as well. I'm intrigued to see how well he does in, in the Premier League. The only issue for West Ham is Mikel Antonio has been absolutely phenomenal so oh. far this season. Like yeah. probably the best player in the Premier League so far to date, I would probably argue, at least in terms of what yeah. we expected from him. And the depth at striker is really, really poor. I don't actually even, can't even think who their backup striker is off the top of my head. They don't so, really have one. Yeah, that's my, that's my only worry. And without Lingard being able to play that false nine, I'm not sure whether Vlasic can play as a false nine if Antonio gets injured. So that's my concern. But for now, things are looking pretty, pretty rosy in East London. Yeah, I love that sort of front four they've got going on with back, with Bowen coming off the right and Sai Ben Rama and Fanaus drifting yeah. around off, off of Antonio. And look, West Ham are playing in the Europa League this year. They're going to be fully aware it's going to be a tough old schedule. And I think having Vlasic to be able to add into that mix is, is smart business. Obviously, they didn't end up getting Jesse Lingard. I think Jesse Lingard would have been a fantastic player for them. Also, a really versatile option to play up front, to play on the right, to play in the hole. I think he'll probably, if Antonio was to get injured, fingers crossed he doesn't, I'd imagine Bowen probably goes through the middle slightly more and then they, they look to use four hours off, off of one of the sides or maybe uh, Vlasic comes into that sort of pocket. So they're pretty fluid, I would say. They're pretty fluid. And even like Crow, they can't play Suchek and Rice every minute of every game again. Like they have <laughs> to have options in there and, and Mark Noble just isn't going to be that guy now. So... Uh, fingers crossed for them. I totally agree, Dukes. I think West Ham's window, after an extremely shaky start, turned out to be very, very good. Um, I mean, there's other sides we should probably talk about in here. Jalab, maybe a, maybe a Villa, maybe a Leicester? Um, yeah, no, I think Villa have had uh, a quite interesting window. Mm. Obviously, losing Jack Grealish is always going to be difficult. The, what he brings to that side creatively and, and, and how everything kind of goes through him uh, one way or another... Replacing that is very difficult. But I feel the way they've done their transfers by kind of not just not just signing one big star and hoping they can all go through him by signing a few different guys and and hoping um, and hoping they can contribute to goals uh, has been the best way. When Dia, Danny Yings, Bailey, um, Ashley Young, who, who I think more so fullback, um, has been have been really good signings and and two and Zabi on loan as well to uh, to play at the back. I think is is good too. Um, I mean. They've already got people as well like Bertrand Traore, um, Tre uh, Trezeguet as well, who also were pretty good last year. But uh, and, and so far they've been okay. They've not been amazing, but I think there's got to be a bit of a period, a bit of a bedding in period for all these players. The way Aston Villa have played their football for the past kind of four or five years has all been for Jack Grealish, with mm. Jack Grealish. Um, and so it's going to take a little bit of time for them on the pitch um, and who knows, maybe another month or so. Um, until you see these guys all really coming together, especially with Ollie Watkins as well, because I think they have a, a fantastic side, especially in attack, um, and I think the defence isn't too bad anyway. Um, but yeah, especially in attack, where they're going to maybe move to a bit more of like a, a four-four-two. Potentially, they can still do four-three-three, three. Um, but with these with these guys, with Bailey on one wing, uh, Buendia on the other wing, and, and Watkins and Ings um, up front. I mean, they've already got Douglas Louise in midfield, McGinn as well in midfield too. So I think they're they're going to be okay. I just think it, it's going to take a, a little bit of time for them all to bed in, because not only is it is it tough bringing in one player, but bringing in three possible starters into a, a side of 11 men. Um, is, is never going to be easy, especially with with what they were doing with Jack Grealish. Um, so yeah, I think they've they've they'll they'll be okay. It just takes a little bit of time, and I'm sure Aston Villa fans will be uh, buzzing to see their new signings play. Yeah. Their um their talent identification has clearly got so much better. Because yeah. I'm just looking at yeah. their outgoings down here. Like you've seen Wesley go out on loan. Like obviously he was really unfortunate with that horrific injury he mm. got. But Mbwana Samata as well. He's left for 5.4 million pounds. Like they wasted a lot of money. In that, I think they spent over £100 million when they went up to the Premier League. They did a sort of the Fulham strategy of buying like nine, ten players. And some of them, like El Ghazi, have come off. But some of the others, like Wesley, Samata, etc., players like that, are now sort of leaving the door for, for losses. So, yeah, I think I think credit to their uh, scouting department for, for just upping their game, really. 
Yeah, I think the two and Zabi one's an interesting one, to be honest with you. Like, the £5 million loan fee, obviously, he comes in as a backup option. But, you know, Tyrion Mings has struggled recently, in my opinion, towards the back end of last season. At the start of this season, he's looked a little bit shaky. Um, so, two and Zabi's obviously come in to put pressure on him. But if you're Axel two and Zabi, like, I'm surprised he's not going to get guaranteed starts in the Premier League at this stage. Like, I don't think he's a guaranteed starter in that Villa central defensive pairing. Um, so that's a bit of an odd one, but yeah, I totally agree. The other moves, Leicester, I think classically, Leicester's recruitment is just so good. You know, Dakar's record um, in Austria is, is frighteningly amazing. Uh, and he seems to be a similar sort of profile to Jamie Vardy, you know, very much want to play on the shoulder. Um, he's slightly more, can play a little bit wider as well so that's good give him a little bit more versatility but even stuff like getting Adeloma Lookman through the door on deadline day is a really smart bit of business mm -hmm. we've got huge question marks haven't we about yeah. whether or not Ayosi Perez is is good enough and having the options of Lookman, Perez, Barnes, Daka can play wide I think I'm forgetting somebody else as well is is much preferable to what they had last year um, hopefully Iheanacho can continue where he kind of left off at the back end of last season so i like i think they are now doing such smart recruitment that it's just kind of just oh it's leicester in it leicester have done it again <laughs> like to bring yeah. in samare for 18 million pounds it's kind of people just shrug their shoulders it's just a classic leicester move and daca it's just a classic leicester move whereas they do still need credit for uh, this really good talent identification that they've, they've managed to get going not sure on the vestergaard transfer not is he already injured as well? Not the biggest fan of that move. That yeah. feels like an un Leicester like move, given that they. Ha I know that Vestergaard had one year left on his contract, and Leicester had and Leicester had huge central defensive issues with Fafana's leg break. But you know, I, I said it on we need to talk this week. They could have had Christoph Ayer for less than they're paying for Vestergaard here. Uh, yeah, I've got. I'm slightly suspect about that one, but the rest of the business <laughs> just feels really smart. Yeah, I put it, I, I put Vestergaard in ten biggest panic buys. I think it was because Evans and Fofana right, they just needed a body in, and it was just unfortunate that as soon as that body arrived, he got injured in training. But I think when Justin and Evans and Suyuncu are all fit in firing, he's he's going to be fourth choice. It's funny because the fact that they've had they have had a good window and they and they really have kind of especially in the attack as you mentioned have, have improved uh, and yet they're still not going to get Champions League football. I mean, don't <laughs> say never say never. You never know. Never say never. They're never always, say never. In they're true. always in and around that mix, and there's always one of the big boys has yeah, uh, and falls <laughs> out of there somehow and some yeah. uh, for some reason. Uh, any other clubs you want to point to? I think the Spurs deserve a shout. To be honest with you. Well, I mean, just before Spurs, I actually really wanted to mention Arsenal. Um, oh, controversial I, because, for winners. Because I I don't know how this is going to go, but I don't actually think Arsenal had a terrible transfer window. I'm with you, Zach. At all. Yeah, um, I agree. They may have... They may have overspent on on Ben White um, for, for fifty two million pounds, but listening off these names, these are actually these are some really good um, incomings. Ben White, Odegaard, Ramsdale, uh, Tommy Se Tommy Asu, Tommy yes. Asu, uh, Lukonga, and Nuno Tavares. Now. I think those are fantastic, fantastic signings. But their outgoings, I think, actually haven't been terrible. Uh, Willock for £26 million pounds isn't uh, isn't a bad fee. I know these guys are all loans, but eventually they could become permanents as well. Torreira, Guendouzi, Saliba, Nelson, Bellerin, and obviously David Lloris, um got released from his contract. But uh, yeah, I mean, their incomings are definitely much better than their, their outgoings. And I think for the future, whether that's going to be Mikel Arteta as the manager or whoever it be, uh, has some really good players there for... For over the next couple of a uh, couple of years for for Arsenal, I mean, their um, Lukonga when I've watched him play in midfield recently has really impressed me. In the Chelsea mm. game, although they weren't great, Lukonga was maybe that that shining light. And obviously, adding these players um, with the with the young stars that they've already got already, Kieran Tierney, brilliant. Um, Emil Smith Rowe has also been kind of their shining light, and and, and Saka. Um, they have a squad that can can you know eventually become a, become very good. Odegaard as well, we know how great he is. Um, my worry, obviously, is is the uh, the Mikel Arteta situation, and, and, and it's getting very, very rough and, and hot um, in that Arsenal boardroom. <laughs> I think at the moment. Um, hot I don't and sweaty. Know, yeah, hot and sweaty indeed. Especially if you Mikel Arteta, you're pulling your uh, your shirt back a bit. Um, but I think in terms of transfers, they are they have done very, very well. Um, a lot of these guys are extremely young, and um, they've kind of, by the sounds of it, it looks like the board have basically thought, okay. Whatever happens with our manager situation, we're still going to be bringing in players who are 
young and high quality, a little bit Crystal Palace-esque, I guess. Um, you know, Arsenal being compared to Palace, you would have thought. Um, mm. and, 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 and yeah, allowing the, the next manager, or if, if Arteta pulls it around, to kind of have this young squad that he can build around and, and for the next few years at Arsenal. I'm not as hot as, as Zach. I think it's a good window, but I think the outgoings have been really poor. And the fees have been like over the top, but overall, like at least they've got a vision, at least they're planning, in my opinion, much better than they did last summer. Yeah, I agree with you on the outgoings. I think you really want a fee for Genduzi, Torreira, even Saliba. It's a real shame, but maybe you know Arteta might not last the season. But he just doesn't seem to be in Arteta's plans whatsoever. Because if he was, then I think he'd definitely be brought back, and then they could have a a, a four at the back of of Gabriel White. Saliba and, and Pablo Mari potentially or, or Rob Holding is that fourth slot so he's clearly not in Arteta's plan so I probably would have tried to get a fee for him same with Reese Nelson I'm not sure he'll ever break into that side and Hector Bellerin at this stage probably should have got a fee for him as well but I actually agree with Zach in terms of the incomings like Odegaard, Ramsdale, Tomiyasu, Lukonga they should all have massive sell-on values Nuno Tavares as well potentially as well Ben White feels like you know, it, it's probably, you know, they have overpaid for that, maybe £10 million. But it was only six months ago that we were lauding Ben White for being one of the best emerging centre-backs yeah. in the division. Yes, he had a poor game on his debut against Brentford, but then contracted COVID. Like, we shouldn't forget that he's a very, very competent, you know, England-level centre-back. And yes, he's got some issues in the air, but hopefully alongside Gabriel, who is better in the air, he'll improve on that as well. And the sooner that Pablo Mari gets himself together, the better <laughs> for that whole side. But I just, I just think Arsenal fans need to be realistic. Like you finished eighth in back-to-back -back years. You're not going to be buying necessary players that have loads of Champions League experience that are at Champions League mm. level right now. You've got to build your squad to get back into that top four and wait until Klopp and Guardiola leave in four years' time when there's a potential opening. And this, with Odegaard, Smith-Rowe, Saka, all developing at the same age, Lukonga too, White, Gabriel. Like there are the parts of this side could grow together quite nicely in the next two to three years. I just think you haven't got enough money for your deadwood. And we talked about Chelsea selling players well earlier. They've made £100 million in sales four times in the last 10 years. No other club has done it more than once. Uh, and Arsenal have done that once uh, in a season as well. So they just need to get better at selling their players at the right time. Uh, and when, But it, to be fair to them, this, this market during COVID, not the easiest to sell in. So it's, it's, some of it is situational as well. But overall, I give Arsenal's window like, a C plus. Yeah, I think it's right in the middle of the road. I, I agree. Uh, I also want to just go across North London to Spurs, so I think I've had a better window than Arsenal, to be honest with you. Um, I actually think their window has gone slightly under the radar as to how good it has been, especially with uh, yesterday's news that Serge Aurier has cancelled his contract or they've terminated that contract. <laughs> I think um, Emerson Royale coming into the side is pretty exciting. If you're a Tottenham Hotspur fan, I think Romero at the back is a huge upgrade on their current defensive options. My washing machine's just kicking up an absolute roar. Um, <laughs> I think Brian Hill swap deal for Lamella was smart business. Shut the f up, washing machine, um, <laughs> to be honest with you. I think keeping Harry Kane, obviously the biggest double yeah, the window course, for them course. and agreeing a new contract, four or five year contract with Hoi Min Son, all in the process, yeah. I think he's, I think that's good. If you'd have said to Spurs at the start of the window, you're going to keep Kane, you're going to extend Son, you're going to sign the best defender in Syria, you're going to sign Brian Hill, you're going to um, sign a new right back, a backup keeper. They'd have said, bloody hell, we'll take that every single day of the week. <laughs> yes, you didn't get the backup striker that you necessarily needed through the door, but given that how we've seen Nuno set up at the start of the season with this kind of transitional front three that want to play fast on the counter-attack as they sit back a little bit deeper to absorb pressure... I think that's absolutely fine because Son has proven his ability to do that time and time again through the middle. Uh, I don't think it could have gone too much better for them. The Ndombele situation yeah, still kind of ugly, hanging over the team a little bit. I think he probably does want to leave, especially now that Aurier has gone, Sissoko has gone. Those were the sort of players that people were saying is his friendship True. group and the reason he wants to leave. Um I just think that they probably could have done with getting that sorted. You know, he is, the, I think, the second or third highest paid player at the club. Still the record transfer because, of course, um, Romero is an initial loan, a little bit like they yeah. did Gio Lo Celso. So that situation, I don't know what you boys think about Ndombele, well, but it needs to be resolved. 
I mean, the fact that Nuno's come in as well, and like obviously when Mourinho's kind of had a fallout with him, you, you sit there and you go, "Look, it's Mourinho." You, you think, um, "Okay, he always has a fallout with one of the one of the better players." It's just how it is. The fact that Nuno has to come in and and he's still not in the pecking order um, does worry me. Uh, it, it really does. And the fact is, for 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 Ndombele, he's kind of happy to sit there and, and get paid, as he said, the, one of the highest amounts at the club, um, and not play football. Uh, I mean, sure, some, it depends on what kind of footballer he is. Some do want to go out there, and even if they're on a high wage, and just get minutes, and, and that is how it is. But by the sounds of it, he didn't necessarily try to force through um, any any move himself. And so I I, I really think Ndombele is a talented footballer. I think he's fantastic uh, at what he does. And I would love to, him, to see him get pushed back into that Spurs squad one day, and hopefully it kind of sorts itself out, because that, that, that Spurs squad with him at his best, I think, is a, is a better squad than without him. Um, but it is, a, it is a weird situation. I also kind of um, wonder where Spurs have got all this money because I kind of I kind of kept thinking, oh, the reason they're spending all this money is because they're going to let Harry Kane go and, and use that money to bring in all these players. And obviously now they've kept Harry Kane, that's amazing. It's the best deal that they, they got out of uh, this summer for sure. Um, and I know a few of these, as you mentioned, are loan moves, so they're going to be paying it next Yeah, they've year. been smart. They've been smart with the business. They haven't spent so, a lot of money at all. Romero, obviously, is going to be delayed that fee. Brian Hill was part of a swap deal with Lamella, so I think that was, what, yeah. 20-odd million? Like, Royale was, what, 20 million? Then Gallini was obviously a loan as well. So I think their, their overall summer spend is probably less than, like, £40 million. Pound. Precisely, but there's a there's a bit where I think next year when these when they do have to obviously obviously spend this money uh, for these guys that they bring in on on loans, I can't remember if some of them are options or obligations. Um, they might have to sell a few more players to, to do so. But again, I I think you're right. I think they have had a great window. The fact that they kept kept Harry Kane probably puts them at a uh, a at like a, a B plus mm. or maybe maybe mm. even an A. Yeah, uh, let's move on to some quick fire questions then. This one from Swagato is back. He says, thoughts on PSG rejecting 200 million for a player with one year left, Dukes? It's pretty sickening, to be honest, if you break it down and, and think about it. Like, it's absolutely mental, to be honest. I don't know why PSG haven't accepted it. I don't know why Real Madrid have offered it as well <laughs> in, in equal measure. And all that's happened now is Mbappe who apparently, I was listening to a podcast this week with Julien Laurent, the PSG fan and French football expert, and he was saying, you know, Mbappe and his family and his entourage are some of the most stubborn people in football. Like, he just won't sign a new contract and he'll mm. leave for free next summer. It's almost a guarantee. And fair enough to him, he really wants to play for Real Madrid for whatever reason, because I think right now they look at one of their lowest ebbs. Well, La Liga as a whole look at one of its lowest ebbs since... I don't know, the mid, you know, early part of the first decade of this century, if that makes sense, around 2007 period when La Liga started coming into its own again. And Real Madrid as well, not in the best of shapes right now, mm. although the Camavinga deal yesterday was was fantastic, to be fair, but their defence still looks a little shaky. So I, I don't know why he wants to join Real Madrid when PSG have got a much better chance of winning the Champions League this year. But if it's, if it's a childhood dream, it sort of makes sense. But... It's just it just goes to show how ridiculous football has become, and particularly PSG's finances and the finances at the top of the Premier League that they can reject two hundred million pounds for a player <laughs> like Mbappe. It's yeah. just mental. There was a lot of chat about um, about kind of Real Madrid, uh, Real Madrid calling PSG's bluff essentially, uh, and that actually Real Madrid didn't have that money, um, <laughs> uh, and what they were trying to do was was show Mbappe, look, we're trying we're trying so hard, we're you know we're going to break the record for you and all this, um, whereas realistically, Frontier Paris are sitting there going. Please, for God's sake, PSG, do not accept this bid. Do not accept it. Yeah. Um, That's when they'd I mean, have to wheel out the dodgy fax machine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, we don't know that for sure. But, I mean, PR-wise, like, Real Madrid come out of it uh, to Mbappe as, as the heroes. Uh, they've, done, they've done everything they possibly can. Yeah, yeah. We're going ha to have to wait another year for you, but you know, and get you for free. What a shame. But you know, I managed to get Camavinga through the door, didn't they? Yeah. Right, and Pogba's yeah. still not signed a new contract, so I'm sure that Madrid will be interested in Pogba. And then if you look in a year's time, Mbappe comes for free, Pogba comes for free, Camavinga comes for 30 mil, suddenly Real Madrid's side looks in a much, much better position yeah. in terms of a think, profile and quality, doesn't it? I was going to say, I think PSG are kind of hoping that, look, get this, get this final year with... When, with Mbappe and he's with Messi and that and maybe that'll try and convince him that he wants to stay so he can play with Messi longer and win the Champions League or whatever and also um, let's let's we'll not see. forget there's a heavy factor for QSI like the Qatar Sports Investment Fund that is thinking to themselves we can capitalise <laughs> massively on Messi and Mbappe and Neymar commercially ahead of the Qatar yeah. World Cup in 2022 oh, yeah. the monetary figure on that is probably in excess of 200 million 
um, Euros and I'm sure that they are in the back of their heads thinking they can utilize those three names to massive effect in terms mm. of Qatari PR head of that World Cup. Um, next one, Isak Krishnan says, the most underrated newly appointed coach in Europe. This is an interesting one. Um, trying to think off the top of my head. I mean, Bru we've got Julian Bruno Nagelsmann. Large has surprised me. Yeah, Bruno Large has been really excited really how, how he was playing. Uh, Bless him out how they've... Uh, have they scored yet? I can't, don't think they... Don't they? think they have, think. but they've got, they're, they've yeah, been putting up but, like 20 shots a game without scoring. They've been a real man. They've been really, really good <laughs> so far. I like the way he's um, he's kind of moved Triore onto, onto the to the left wing. And, and he's been... For a guy that, I'll be quite honest, did not know too much about when he, when he joined um, and took over at Wolves kind of said, oh, it's just, you know, another Portuguese manager coming in. Um, he really has surprised me so far. I think he's going to be a, they're going to be a really tough team to play against. As you said, I think, uh, uh, yeah, they're averaging about 20 shots a game, which can't mm. be, uh, can't be laughed at and will eventually um, see them scoring goals for sure. Yeah, I think um, uh, Rafa Benitez deserves a shout out here as well. Like, obviously, pretty grim, pretty grim circumstance around the transfer window, but he's going to, have a very solid season with Everton I think mm. Rafa Benitez I think Dominic Cavalier is going to score a bucket load of goals given how he is going to line up that side with Damari Gray on the wing uh, who has started brilliantly by the way Damari he's Gray awesome, like yeah. he's been written off time and time again but he started this season just about as well as it's possible to start so uh, I think Rafa Benitez is, is a decent shout I think Christophe Galtier at Nice um, could have a very decent season this year as well, but yeah, I'd probably go Rafa as my, as my shout. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of shouts from the continent actually. Wolfsburg and Mark van Bommel have started really well. They beat Leipzig last weekend. Maurizio Sarri at Lazio. I think they've scored yeah. nine goals in their first two games. Uh, Sergei Milinkovic Savic is absolutely purring right now. And then credit where it's due. Got to say, on the back of a start, Jose Mourinho deserves a big shout out. Yeah, yeah. they've absolutely yeah. smashed it. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, admittedly, they're playing against ten men in their first game, and then a team that had just been newly promoted in their second. But still, I think it's seven goals so far, and um, just looking like a really good unit. Tammy Abraham looks absolutely excellent. Uh, so does Olivier Giroud, by the way. He started really well at yeah, AC I Milan see. as well. That's not to say that Chelsea didn't make the right decision. I think it just goes to show how how high quality. You know how how good a player you needed to be to break into this Chelsea team at the moment. So yeah, credit to all those three managers. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do one more then from Aiden underscore eighteen seventy four, who says, "Has the transfer window changed your thoughts on any of the Prem predictions in either a positive or a negative way?" I do think if I could have my time again, I would swap uh, Brentford and Norwich around in terms mm. of. Um, I think it was twenty. I think I had them like 18th, 17th or something like that. I'd probably swap them about and put yeah, Norwich in the relegation in zone. Relegation. Um, that seems like a bit of an error on my part, even though that wasn't necessarily the transfer window changing that. I just think that I probably got that one wrong. And maybe I'd have Everton shifted up a little bit just because I think I underestimated Rafa Benitez's impact. So you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have United closer to the top? I still think that United are going to finish third, even with Ronaldo, but I just think it'll be a much, much closer third. Close I think it might gap. be like yeah. two, three Fair points. Enough. Um, trying to think I've also probably put Norwich in the relegation zone now um, <laughs> that I've seen them um, I probably wouldn't have Aston Villa as high up as as I, I did I think I had them like 7th or something like that I can't quite remember exactly um, but uh, I'm, I'm still happy with my Arsenal shout I think Arsenal are going to finish below them oh where did you um, put Arsenal actually because I might need to revise my Arsenal shout I had, oh, you I had, had Arsenal in 5th mate I had them 5th yeah. but I would only probably that. revise it to 6th or 7th like wow, I wouldn't go okay. as far as I've seen some people having them like 13th I'd, I'd maybe mm. revise no, it 6th no. or 7th oh. but I still think they'll be in and around that's, that race for, for between 5th and 8th I don't know. I'm thinking eighth, maybe, maybe tenth. Oh, to, be, to, be, to be quite honest, with the way it's going for them at the moment. Um, but, but yeah, like even a Bam, even one of the biggest shots, like Bamyang, just doesn't even. We've always said like, oh, Bamyang will get back to it. Bamyang will get back to it. It just doesn't look like he's going to get back to it. He really hey, doesn't. Were well, you talking about? It's got um, a Hattie against West Brom, didn't they? Oh, wow. West Brom's under twelves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, very. Yeah, yeah. My, West, um, Arsenal put out a stronger team than West Brom. West Brom <laughs> chose it to rest their players. Mate. Yeah. My um, my shout that I slightly regret. It was my only really bold shout in my predictions was Leeds in sixth, and they haven't started the season that great. They obviously got smashed by United, and then drew against Everton and Burnley at the weekend as well. And what was quite a good game against Burnley. Um, not saying that they won't finish in the top 10 or that it'll be a complete disaster, but having them above Spurs and Arsenal, because I was kind of thinking that Spurs were going to lose Harry Kane as well, was maybe a little bit bold from me. Mm. 
Okay, should we do one final personal question then? Favourite film trilogy from Saganator? Trilogy? I'm going to go for Jason Bourne. Anything from you, Zach? Yeah. Uh, does the Fast and Furious count even though it's more than three uh, I'll give it to you I'll give it to you because we're up against the time clock because Dewey's Thank you. about to break <laughs> <laughs> uh, favourite trilogy has to be Lord of the Rings uh, okay. I used to star myself on Aragon at uni when I had long hair <laughs> oh uh, I wish this wasn't time up against the time I'd love to drill down to that I would love to drill <laughs> down to that honestly uh, quickly going to read out our comments of the week then 10 transfers that could flop this season the comments from Joe W it's on screen now but he says Dan James at Leeds has huge potential playing alongside some brilliant wide talent with a coaching staff who saw potential years ago and we already know exactly what they want from him about how to get it I kind of agree with you I think Dan James is going to do really well at Leeds and then Edwin Moani says Brahim Diaz is an absolute bargain for AC Milan he just ran the show yesterday and was an absolute baller and I wishing the best during his time at Milan. Aww. There we go then. If you want to get involved and get your comment read out next week, bang it in our listicle videos, our top 10s, our transfer talks, all of that good stuff. We are about to die because Doogie's computer is broken. So yeah. we're just going to wrap it up there, lads. Hope you don't mind. Perfect. Thanks uh, for watching, guys. For another week of Sunday Vibes. Thanks very much for watching. See you later. Bye-bye.